Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this uh, video we will start talking about uh, discrete uh, mass spring systems uh, as an example of periodic structures. In the previous videos we introduced what periodic structures are and uh, the kinds of types of periodicity and why are we really interested in uh, the phenomena of periodic structures uh, because of uh, the reflections, the wave reflections that may interfere, uh, interfere destructively to reduce uh, the vibration. In this video, we will introduce uh, uh, the uh, discrete uh, mass spring systems. Uh, and in the uh, next video, we will introduce uh, the case where the masses are alternating. They are changing from one mass to the other, but again in a periodic uh, manner. Uh, here uh, we will start by uh, this simple uh, periodic uh, system. Uh, the, uh, the masses and springs are identical. Uh, they uh, are all, uh, all the masses are, uh, have values that are equal to uh, 2m. Uh, the springs are all of uh, stiffness k. So uh, this is an identical cell that is repeated. We can uh, uh, choose the cell to be the spring and uh, a mass, or we may uh, split the masses, uh, as we've done here, uh, to take half a mass uh, on one side and half the mass on the other side connected with a spring. This is actually easier uh, to manipulate, although uh, if we chose the other way around, we will get the same result. So I'm just interested here in uh, using the simple way to demonstrate what we are doing. Uh, the first step, as we did before, is obtaining the uh, equations of motion. Uh, for this case, you may recall from discrete di uh, the dynamics of discrete systems that uh, the equation of motion may be written as uh, the mass times an acceleration vector uh, plus a stiffness matrix times the displacement vector equal to the excitation uh, force. Uh, transforming this into uh, the frequency domain by introducing harmonic excitations, we get a relation between the amplitudes of x1 or the motion of the first mass and the amplitude of x2, the motion of the second mass, uh, multiplied by matrix to be equal to the amplitudes of the excitation uh, forces. Uh, the relation now contains uh, the excitation frequency. Again, we are uh, assuming harmonic uh, excitations. This can be rearranged like we did in the uh, generic uh, periodic system uh, by, by moving everything that's uh, on the input side, on the left hand side, to one side of the equations and everything on the output side to the other side to get this uh, relation. Uh, this relation, as you remember for we call this the uh, transfer matrix. Uh, the transfer matrix uh, can be replaced by uh, the matrix capital T, uh, which uh, relates the input of one cell to the input of the following cell. Uh, uh, this relation, as you remember, uh, uh, was given by the exponential uh, term e to the power mu, where mu is our propagation uh, coefficient or pr propagation uh, factor. Uh, as you can see here, this presents actually a, uh, an eigenvalue problem. Uh, the eigenvalues of the matrix T are going to be e to the mu, uh, which we call lambdas. Uh, these uh, mu, uh, e to the mu's can be obtained using logarithm or uh, cosine, inverse uh, hyperbolic cosine. Uh, but first, let's get the eigenvalues by taking the determinant, which produces the characteristic equation. Here you have a second order uh, relation in lambda which can be readily solved as any parabolic equation uh, to obtain lambda in terms of the parameters. Uh, in this relation, as you can see, what's under the root uh, can be either positive, zero, or negative. If what's under the root is positive, then uh, we have uh, positive uh, lambdas, positive real lambdas. 
uh, if we have uh, the uh, sorry positive or negative uh, if what's under the root is negative then uh, we obtain a complex value of lambda let's now focus on what constitutes the pass band uh, in that case we have a negative uh, uh, root uh, the, the what's under the root is negative let's get back here if this term is less than one then when it's uh, when one is uh, subtracted from it the whole will be a negative number this is what we're talking about here if this is less than one then we have what we called before a pass band uh, expanding this we will get uh, what's inside the squared bracket is either greater than or equal to minus one uh, not either sorry is greater than or equal to minus one and less than one manipulating further we can obtain that omega uh, omega squared then will be greater than zero and less than twice k over M. Notice here that omega has always to be greater than zero. There is no physically, there is no uh, a negative uh, frequency or, of course, negative squared number. Uh, now, this can be used to obtain the uh, uh, propagation factor. Uh, the propagation vector will, uh, factor will be uh, lambda uh, plus the other lambda, which is one over it. Uh, uh, over 2. If you do the algebra, you'll obtain this term, but this is less than uh, 1. Uh, so what we will get is uh, a, a, a comp uh, not a complex, uh, an imaginary value of lambda. This imaginary value is obtained using the arc cosine instead of the arc hyperbolic cosine, uh, we can get this. Uh, maybe I'm using a lot of the uh, characteristics of the uh, hyperbolic cosine function here, so it may be useful if you revised it uh, uh, through any of your calculus books or any uh, that uh, deals with special functions, uh, the hyperbolic uh, functions especially. Okay, now uh, if we uh, go and try to see what happens uh, when the other thing happens. Uh, uh, now, instead of having uh, this term less than 1, uh, as we had here, uh, we are going to see what happens when it's greater than 1. If it is greater than 1, then we obtain one of two conditions. Either it is less than minus 1, which is impossible, because it just means that uh, the uh, omega squared m over k is less than zero. Omega squared can never be less than zero. m and k can never be less than zero. So this is an impossible condition. Or the other condition in which omega squared m over k is greater than two. Uh, this case will give us that omega squared is greater than two of k of uh, two times k over m. Uh, finally, we get the eigenvalues. In this case, both are real numbers. Uh, when they are both real numbers, adding them, we lose the square root part, and we get a negative uh, of omega squared m over k minus 1, as you can see here. To get rid of this negative, we uh, get a minus pi here, a constant imaginary part, and the rest is just... Uh, uh, the inverse of the hyperbolic cosine function. I'm now sure that this is always greater than 1 because of the condition that we obtained. So this is going to be always uh, a number that uh, is good. And as, uh, as, I rem uh, as you may remember, we are going to use the positive number uh, for uh, uh, simpli uh, simplifying the presentation. So now we have both uh, uh, stop band and pass band. The stop band will extend for all values of omega squared greater than 2 k over m and the uh, pass band is for all the values of omega squared that are less than 2 k over m and greater than 0. Uh, just to uh, make things clearer, let's use uh, uh, some numbers here. 
uh, if we used uh, the mass is equal to one kilogram while the stiffness is equal to one newton per meter of course the number one is well uh, is uh, easy to handle uh, we uh, change the values of frequencies from uh, zero to two radians per second and see what happens to do this uh, a very simple uh, octave program uh, that may run on octave free mat or even uh, MATLAB uh, is written. Uh, you can uh, copy and paste this uh, from uh, the lecture notes uh, right away to uh, run it and see what happens. Uh, if we run this program, we will get uh, the changing values of the eigenvalues, as you can see here. The first part between 0 and almost 1.4, which is square root of 2, when the uh, natural frequency changes from 0 to square root of 2, you get complex eigenvalues. These complex eigenvalues are all in a complex conjugate. Uh, so what we are seeing here is actually only the, the real part of uh, the eigenvalue. Then uh, after uh, the natural frequency, uh, or as soon as the natural frequency reaches square root of 2 and more than that, we get two uh, different, two uh, non-identical uh, eigenvalues, uh, and one of them is less than minus c between the minus 1 and the 0, and it's growing smaller, uh, I mean, in absolute values, of course, while the other is getting uh, uh, a larger negative value, uh, and if you checked they will always be the reciprocal of one another. Uh, one over this value will give you the corresponding value of the other eigenvalue, which actually is uh, uh, what we uh, uh, said uh, when we were talking about periodic analysis, but now we can see it directly. I, I didn't use the property that uh, lambda and 1 over lambda exist as eigenvalues. I just calculated the two eigenvalues here, and uh, I obtained uh, what we uh, expected before. Now, if we use these eigenvalues to obtain the propagation factor, so we will just use a logarithm or uh, the arc cosine. Uh, in that case, you will find that we have an imaginary number and the zero real number. So the imaginary part is increasing from zero to pi uh, as the frequency changes from zero to uh, square root of two. As soon as it reaches square root of two, it plateaus at the value of, of the imaginary part, stops or gets a constant value of pi, uh, while the real part uh, starts growing from zero uh, and uh, growing uh, uh, as we uh, increase the frequency. So this is where the stop band begins. So now we have a pass band. The pass band, as you can see, extends in this area, while the stop band starts at square root of 2 and extends uh, forever. Uh, probably, if you remember the, uh, the response of uh, uh, spring mass system to harmonic excitations, uh, you would uh, remember a graph that looks like this. Uh, here, the natural frequency of the spring mass system, uh, in our case, it's square root of 2, uh, and uh, the uh, decay of the response will continue to a very small value, sorry, uh, uh, to very small values. Uh, this decay actually starts at the natural frequency. Okay, uh, maybe you cannot see anything really significant here for the response, the frequency response of the cell. So let's uh, create a small program uh, that um, evaluates the frequency response to six cells connected together. So I created a, a small program that has six of these masses uh, connected with uh, springs between them, and the frequency response appeared to be uh, like this. Uh, here you have six different uh, natural frequencies, uh, and the decay appears here 
more rapidly uh, it starts at the value of root 2 which is a little bit beyond the last natural frequency here uh, and it decays quickly okay so maybe uh, uh, all what we did in periodic analysis is not that useful uh, I didn't get anything new. I didn't see any new phenomena in the uh, frequency response as far as uh, this system uh, we are handling uh, is concerned. But uh, now we applied the principles uh, that we uh, derived in uh, the general periodic analysis. We applied them to a periodic system. We obtained something that uh, says that there is a decay. Uh, however, this was what we already expected before uh, if we were handling a simple uh, mass spring system. Uh, what we're going to do in the next video is change what we already have here uh, from uh, the identical masses to non-identical masses. So we will have alternating values of the masses. Uh, the alternating values will uh, create uh, and again a periodic structure maybe the cell will look different but we'll still have a periodic structure and for the first time we will see the phenomena of uh, stop band appearing somewhere in the middle of our uh, excitation uh, band so uh, let's go to the next video to investigate this uh, phenomena of periodic uh, structures